So now let's look at um, drugs you can use when, or you can take, or your clients can take when in pain. So there are drugs that, there's two categories. There's the NSAIDs drug and there's the opioids drug. The NSAIDs drugs are known as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're basically drugs that you cannot get addicted to, hopefully. And they're also drugs that you can just take over the counter. They're not prescription. Whereas opioid drugs, these are with prescription. You need a prescription um, to get access to these drugs. But the NSAIDs um, are the ones that you can find over the counter. So let's look at some of the drugs that you can get over the counter. Well, the first one we're gonna look at is aspirin, and this is the, uh, also known as salicylic acid. And what's interesting about aspirin is that it's a blood thinner, so anti-platelet um, agent, which means that it does not clot blood, um, it is a blood thinner. So you don't wanna take aspirin if you're taking warfarin, because imagine warfarin, which is a blood thinner, and you combine that with aspirin, which is another blood thinner, you might bleed out, right? It's not, it's not fun. So don't take aspirin with, with the warfarin. It is a blood thinner. It's also antipyretic, which means it reduces fever. It's also analgesic. Analgesic means it reduces pain, it relieves pain, and it's also anti-inflammatory, which means that it reduces inflammation. Okay, so if you have inflammation, if you have fever, if you have pain, this is not a bad medication to take. Now, we always think that this is only used for pain. Aspirin is only used for pain, but it could also be used for arthritis. It could be also used for cardiovascular disease, so heart conditions. If your blood, if you have heart issues and your blood is not pumping properly, you probably would need like a, a blood thinner to help the, the um, blood pump properly in the heart. So aspirin, sometimes they give you a low dose aspirin to um, allow the blood to circulate properly in the heart. Another drug you could take is ibuprofen. And ibuprofen, um, if you look at the trade names or the brand names, it's Advil or it's Motrin. So um, this is an antipyretic, which means fever reducing, reduces fever. It's an analgesic, which means it reduces pain. And it's also anti-inflammatory. Inflammatory, inflammatory um, it reduces inflammation. Same thing with naproxen or Aleve, same function. But here's something interesting, acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, which is also known as Tylenol, has the word no in it. Do you see that? It has the word no in it. Why am I highlighting this? Because it is not anti-inflammatory. So if you go to um, the dentist with inflammatory pain, let's say you have swelling in your uh, gums, for example, and you're in pain, the dentist is not gonna recommend Tylenol for you. Instead, the dentist will recommend Advil. Advil is usually the number one choice, or ibuprofen, because that is anti-inflammatory, whereas Tylenol is not anti-inflammatory. So if you get like swelling or something, it's not gonna help if you take Tylenol, but it will help for fever, it's antipyretic. It will help for pain, because it's analgesic, but not for inflammation. So think of no, as in it's not helpful for inflammation, it's also not affecting coagulation, which means it's also not a blood thinner. If you look at opioids, which are prescription drugs, there are these three ones are the ones you should know. Codeine, this is the one that's commonly prescribed in dentistry, it's like Tylenol 3, strong medication. Morphine is also very strong, and oxycodone is also strong. Um, these drugs are um, needed a prescription is needed and the way these drugs work is that they have to bind to three receptors so remember how we were talking about neurotransmitters and how they come and they bind to the brain or they sorry they bind to a receptor the names of the receptors are mu kappa or delta if they bind to any of those what will happen is you will stop feeling pain and also opioids what they're really good at doing is they they just slow down the brain. They just slow down the central nervous system. They slow down everything in your body. So they make you feel tired. They make you, um, they could make you feel drowsy. They um, make you feel just very relaxed and happy. But it's so easy to get addicted to, and it's really honestly really bad for you, that you need to be mindful. So opioids, they help with pain, they're like a strong, strong pain medication, but they also depress the, the brain and they slow the whole body down. So when you look at what's actually happening when you take a non-opioid drug, so when you take like these drugs, let's say aspirin, what's happening is let's say you get cut, when you get cut, 
and now there's bacteria entering into your body because you know when you got cut you entered bacteria entered into our body well what happens and I go over this in a lot more detail in one of my other videos but what actually happens is that we have enzymes called cox enzymes and cox enzymes when they realize that we're hurt they release prostaglandins which are these yellow dots and when prostaglandins are released, what happens is prostaglandin opens up or dilates the blood vessel. So it opens up the blood vessel and it allows, you can see how the blood vessel is a big, a bigger now, right? It has opened up, it has dilated, it's expanded. Here it's a little bit more narrow. When that happens, all the white blood cells can actually squeeze out. So it squeezes out and it eats up the bad bacteria. But as the white blood cells are squeezing out, Look at the the arm that I got slashed into. It expanded. It's there's swelling. There's more bleeding. There's there's a lot of pain. And when you have swelling, there's a lot of pain. Look at the redness here. Not much red, but here a significant amount of redness. There's a lot of pain. So what happens is when you take aspirin, for example, it blocks the Cox enzyme. And when it blocks the Cox enzyme, there's no prostaglandins being released. When there's no prostaglandins being released, there's no redness, no swelling. We won't feel that pain. That pain that we feel will not feel that. The inflammation will be gone. So that's how it works. It inhibits prostaglandin synthesis. It in stops, inhibits the yellow dots from being produced. So it's uh, in, when that happens, you don't feel the inflammation, you don't get the inflammation, you don't feel the pain either. This is a um, table that just describes <clears throat> or explains all of it. So see how it summarizes everything. So one thing to note over here is that they all help with reducing fever. They're all antipyretic, but are they all anti-inflammatory? No, right? Because acetaminophen is not, or does not help with reducing inflammation. Okay. Um, let's do a question. Which S describes the mechanisms of action for salicylics? What do you think salicylics mean? Come from the word salicylic acid, which is aspirin. So which of these best fall or are the best mechanism of actions for aspirin? If you said B, you are correct. It is a pain reliever. It is fever reducing, it helps with inflammation, and it's also antiplatelet, which means it's like a blood thinner. And in case you're interested, this means stop digestion, anti means stop. This means you feel tired, aspirin does not make you feel tired. And this one um, is a cough suppression, aspirin does not help with cough. Okay, so this is your best answer. What about this question? What is the drug of choice for inflammatory dental pain? Is it aspirin? Is it ibuprofen? Is it acetaminophen? Or is it codeine? The answer is ibuprofen or Advil. Um, studies have shown that Advil, because it, it is an anti-inflammatory, it does help reducing um, pain. Acetaminophen is not anti-inflammatory, so it does not help with inflammatory dental pain. Aspirin, it is anti-inflammatory, but um, it's also a blood thinner, and it's just it's just better. Ibuprofen has shown to have better results, and codeine, codeine is an opioid drug, right, which we gotta reduce until you absolutely need it. Which medication is contraindicated with aspirin? You cannot take with aspirin. And yeah, it is warfarin. That's right, because warfarin is a blood thinner. Remember the word war, you think of people bleeding out in a war. So warfarin is a blood thinner, just like aspirin, and you don't want to combine, combine those two. Digoxin, we talked about it in the previous video, and it's um, used for heart. It's used to dig deeper contractions for the heart. Nifedipine is a... Um, actually, what do you think nifedipine is? This is one that takes, remember it ends in pine, so it's probably calcium channel blocker, yeah. So pine thing that ends in pine is a calcium channel blocker, remember California and pine trees, remember that. And if you know anything about calcium channel blocker, um, remember the trick here, you switch this and it becomes an O, so it causes gingival overgrowth, right? Gingival overgrowth or Another word for saying gingival overgrowth is gingival hyperplasia. And remember, when you think of the word hyper, 
um, hyper means more of, so more gums, right? Hyperplasia means more gingival, more more gums, more gingiva. And nitroglycerin, this is the one that um, we put subgingively, not subgingively, sublingually, sorry, and sublingually, and that what that does, it helps with chest pain. So if you have angina, chest pain, it's nitroglycerin. So aspirin and warfarin are contraindicated. And we're, when we're looking at opioids, one of the worst things that can happen when someone gets high on opioid is their heart could stop breathing. They could stop breathing. And that's called respiratory depression. So they stop breathing, their lungs you know, give out, and that's the cause of death with overdose. That's typically what happens when people OD, respiratory depression. Now let's say someone is, you know, having, is, is really high right now on opioids. What can they do? What can be done? Well, what can be done is they can give them naltrexone. So you can call 911, the medics will come and they'll inject naltrexone. And naltrexone is an opioid antagonist. Remember, antagonist does the opposite. Like, it doesn't work. It, it just tries to reverse the opioid. It blocks, actually, it blocks the effects of opioids, rather. So hopefully, naltrexone will help them with their recovery. When we look at the different opioids, we look at codeine, which is like Tylenol Tylenol 3. We have oxycodone, which is even more stronger. And we have morphine, which is even more stronger. So these are the drugs, and I just highlighted the ones that I think we should know. And when you look at these, you can see morphine is really strong compared to codeine. So all our pharmacologic actions of opioids, except which one? You said excitation, you would be correct. Remember, opioids, what do they do? They just slow everything down in the body, right? They slow everything down. So is it an analgesic? Does it you know help with analgesia? Yeah, it's pain relieving, right? It helps with pain. It helps slow down, it helps with cough, so it, you don't cough as much. And it sedates you, puts you tired, and it gives you that feeling of happiness, intense happiness. So it slows your brain down so you're relaxed and feeling good, and your pain is um, you know, gone, and your cough is gone, and you're sedated, you're tired, and yet you're so happy and content. But it would not excite you, because excitation is the opposite, right? Excitation does not go with all the rest. So by using process of elimination, you can figure out that excitation is not something that opioids will do. You will not get excited and energetic when you take opioids. Naloxone or Narcan is an example of an it's an example of an opioid antagonist where it blocks the opioids um, from working. Antagonist means it blocks, so it blocks it. It's not a perfect fit. When we were looking at the lock and key, it didn't go in properly and it, it um, just blocks, or it doesn't work at all, it just blocks the uh, opioid effect. What happens when we have an infection? So when we have an infection, typically we take antibiotics. And when we take antibiotics, sometimes we can get like super infection. So super infection is another infection on top of another infection, on top of your initial infection. So supra infection is super infection. Infection occurring after or on top of an earlier infection. So let's say I take antibiotics and then after antibiotics I notice I have thrush, like a white patch all over my mouth. That's the second infection. That's known as a super infection. So when we look at antibiotics or anti-infective agents, antibiotic or anti-infective drugs, do you think? There are bactericidal drugs and bacteriostatic antibiotics. Cidal comes from the word suicidal, so it means to kill. So these bacteria, sorry, these antibiotics kill the bacteria, literally kills them. Where, and then we have bacteriostatic, where we have these bacteria, sorry, these antibiotics that slow down the growth of bacteria. They're, they're not killing it, but they're slowing down the growth of bacteria. So the ones that I think are important are um, this one, uh, this one and this one. So cephalosporins, metronidazole, basil, and penicillin. And the way to remember this is if you think of, this is really inappropriate, so I do apologize, but think of C me P. If I if you see me P, you can think of C for C, M for me, and P for P. And that's how you can remember the C for cephalosporins. These are bactericidal. These are um, antibiotics or anti-infective drugs that kill bacteria. ME for metronidazole and PE for penicillin. Okay? 
Okay, and then all the other ones like clindamycin and tetracycline, those are bacteriostatic. They just slow down the growth of bacteria. Um, what is interesting to note here is that penicillin is what is prescribed. If someone needs pre-med, they will be prescribed penicillin. But if someone is allergic to penicillin, then they could be prescribed clindamycin. We will also look at tetracycline, which is an important one in dentistry because if someone takes tetracycline, what can happen is they can get tetracycline stainings. So when you look at this, um, who can get tetracycline stainings? Those people that have um, that are pregnant and children who are younger than nine years of age because then they can get permanent staining and these staining, you know, it's permanent. You can't really do anything about it unless you get uh, cosmetic work done. Okay, let's see what's next. So who do we give pre-med to? Who needs pre-meds? Well, anyone that has a prosthetic cardiac valve. So when I think of the word prosthetic, I think of something uh, made outside, man-made, something fake. So prosthetic is something that was uh, man-made and inputted into the heart like a valve. That person would need a pre-med. Someone who had previous infective endocarditis, so they had, itis means inflammation, they had inflammation in the lining of the heart, Card carditis, carditis comes from um, heart, and endo is like a lining around the heart. So if they had an infection before on um, the lining of the heart, they would need pre-med. And people who were born, congenital means they were born with a heart condition. And if you look at um, Canadian Dental Association, it actually tells you what type of um, congenital conditions are included for pre-med and what you do not need pre-med for. So if you look at it um, over here, if they had any shunts placed in, um, if they had surgery done during the first six months, um, and where prosthetic materials were anything man-made, right, shunts, or prosthetic was in input into their heart um, that can, like a prosthetic patch, that can allow uh, that can require pre-med or antibiotic prophylaxis. And what is the antibiotic that's given? Well, two grams of amoxicillin, okay? Amoxicillin comes from the family of penicillin, one hour before um, the appointment. But if they're allergic to amoxicillin, because a lot of people are allergic to penicillin, I am, um, I get hives, then they can take clindamycin. Okay, so clindamycin or azithromycin or clodithromycin, all from the Dutch family. And again, it has to be one hour before their appointment. Okay, what if you have a viral infection? So what if you have like HS1, HSV1, which stands for herpes simplex virus 1. This is the one that happens, a viral infection in your mouth. Herpes simplex virus 2, this is in the general area that's transmitted sexually. So if you have lesions, and when I say lesions, this is like cold sores. If you have like lots and lots of cold sores on your lips or on the inside, you can even get like sores on the inside of your vesicles, on the inside of your mouth. It could be HSV1 type of um, viral infection. So it, you would take an antiviral drug or agent like a acyclovir. Um, there's also a uh, Docosinol, which is like a brief, I'll show you a picture of that. But notice how all of them end, or most of them end in VIR, VIR for viral or virus infection. Okay, so anything that ends in VIR, you can know that that's for a viral infection, like herpes simplex 1, where you get like cold sores. And if you've ever had cold sores and you had to use a brief, which is um, docosinol or docosinol, Docosinol is probably the better way of saying it. Docosinol or Briva, um, that is for cold sores. And this one you can get without prescription. All the other ones that end in VIR, that one you do need prescription for. Let's say you have thrush in your mouth. So you have a candidiasis. So candidiasis is like thrush in your mouth. Um, it's like a white patch that you have. And um, the treatment for that is nystatin. So nystatin is a great way to get rid of the candidiasis of the thrush and um, it can become in the form of a lozenge or the candy or um, actually this is that's, that's the one that it shows over here and it has a high sugar content but basically you just like it's like a candy so you just swirl it around your mouth and it's hoped to um, reduce the thrush. 
Besides nice tanning, which is good for fungal infection, you can have you can use imidazoles. And imidazoles, they end in azole of that. Uh, there's quatrimazole, there's pedoconazole, and there's fluconazole. And um, they end in azole. And uh, how can you remember this? What, what do you think of when you think of azole? Think about like um, a memory trick that could help you. So um, this is really inappropriate, but when I think of azole, I think of it like that. I think of um, like I think of some like uh, forgive me for saying this, but asshole. And then think of someone who has been, you know, an a hole for you, uh, two words to, and they got karma. You know, bad karma came to them, and they got their whole mouth full of thrush. So if you think of it like that, um, of someone who has thrush in their mouth because they were this to you, then maybe you can remember that anything that ends in asshole or azole um, is for a thrush. Now, I want you to keep this in mind because there's another medication that ends in um, this as well, and I'm going to talk about that, so keep that in mind, okay, because there's another medication that ends in this as well that is not used for thrush, and I will show you that when we get to that slide. Good. Let's talk about gastrointestinal diseases. So let's say, I mean, how many of us have had heartburn or reflux? Um, where we get acid, you know, shot back into our mouth. What do you think would happen if you have heartburn and if you have acid reflux? Let's say if you have acid reflux and the uh, contents get into your, your mouth. What could happen to your teeth? Erosion is correct. So what can happen is because the content that got back up is very acidic, it can erode your teeth. So that's something to be mindful of. Okay, so if someone has GERD, which is a gastrointestinal esophageal reflux disease where, you know, things are coming out this way, um, there are drugs that they can take that can help. So there is something called a histamine 2 blocking agent. And you can see when they end, they end in dyne. Okay, you see that they end in the word dyne. And the way, actually the way you actually say this medication is cimetidine. So cimetidine doesn't you know but just think of it as dying okay and think about what happens when you're dying when you eat when you eat you could possibly get like an acid reflux so these medication histamine 2 blocking agents they are there to help you with um reducing or blocking that the acid from coming back up and then there are something called so that's one medication they can take and sometimes you get a, you, the doctor might prescribe multiple medications to take at once so another medication that could be prescribed is called a proton pump inhibitor and what they do again inhibitor means they block the pump so that acids uh, don't uh, can, can't come in it reduces the acid because that's what we want you just don't want any acid inside the stomach because when you get acid inside the stomach it can go up so when you look at the ending of the proton pump inhibitors, do you see how I was talking about the fungal infection that they end in azole? Well, prazole, if it has a P right before it, so if it has a PR or P right before it, before the azole, remember that that would be a protein pump inhibitor. So protein pump inhibitor, P for protein pump, P for prazole, and this is for acid reflux. This is for GERD. This is for gastroesophageal um, reflux disease. Okay, so Prazol and anything that ends in dying. They are for, um, and also antacids, so um, like Tums. Tums is also another one that you can take when you have an acid reflux. So histamine 2, they end in dying. Proton pump inhibitors, they end in P, so Prazol, like these examples here. And they can also take uh, antacids, um, so like tops. Anti-emetics, when you think of anti-emetics, this is for um, throwing up, so to put anti means stopping the vomiting. And there are medications that help stop medicate and uh, stop vomiting. Laxatives are also important. Um, they also fall under the category for the gastrointestinal um, drugs. Okay, let's look at what can happen or what drugs someone can take. We're gonna, we're gonna look at brain disorders, okay? Actually, let me just check something. 
Um, I have a question before I move on. So here's a question. Which of the following is the best non-narcotics and non-prescription um, um, or over-the-counter analgesic pain reliever for the management of a dental patient with peptic ulcer disease or gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD? Which of the following is the best one to take? Tricky one. The answer is actually A, Tylenol. Because Tylenol does not aggravate the stomach. Aspirin and NSAIDs basically do aggravate the stomach. They can, you know, um, these medications can cause and can worsen the ulcer that you have and further aggravate the GERD. But Tylenol, tylenol um, itself is the best choice. It will not upset the stomach. Um, this one right here, Tylenol 3, this is codeine, and codeine is an opioid, and it's not asking for opioid, it's asking for non-narcotic, right? So these are all the examples of non-narcotic, but NSAIDs can upset the stomach, so uh, acetaminophen is the one that doesn't upset the stomach, so this is your best option. Okay, so let's look at brain disorders. So if you have, um, if you are... If you are having hallucinations, or if you know of someone that's having hallucinations, or disordered thoughts, or paranoia, or you know if someone is schizo uh, schizophrenic, um, these are the type of medications they could be taking. Now this first generation medication, and these are the ones that have lots and lots of side effects. Second generation uh, medications are the better ones, they don't have a lot of side effects. And notice that they end in a time, not sorry. Not pine, I don't even think of pine because we know that pine is for calcium channel blockers, which is for the heart. This is a pine, okay? They have an A right before it. So, a pine is the, an antipsychotic agent. It helps with hallucinations, it helps with people who are schizophrenic, it helps with um, paranoia. And so, how can you remember this? Well, think of a pine magazine. You have one pine magazine, a pine magazine, and that pine magazine is really good for people who are under. Uh, you know, who are hallucinating, who are schizophrenic. Um, and that, when they look at that, just imagine them just relaxing um, when they see that. The soothing pine image, soothing pine trees. So anything that ends in a pine is for antipsychotic uh, reasons. The drug is for antipsychotic. Or the drug falls under the antipsychotic uh, category. Now, when we look at the antipsychotic drugs, the way it actually works is, um, let me show you uh, another picture, okay? But before I show you the other picture, there's, if you are depressed, okay, so if you, we're looking at all different brain disorders, so if you are not feeling well and you're depressed, there are drugs that you can take, like SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SNRI, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and a tricyclic antidepressant. I'm going to circle the word serotonin. I'm also going to start, um, highlight the word norepinephrine. Okay, these make us feel good. If we have serotonin in our body, we feel good. If we have norepinephrine in our body, we feel good. What happens is when you have, when you take this drug, which is known as the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, what it does is when these serotonin this is all serotonin. When they come out of the neuron, and they're in the synapse here, which is the middle part, um, it has to bind to a receptor, and once it binds to a receptor, um, it will do its job. What happens with this medication is it shuts off, it blocks, so you can see this, these are blockers, it blocks the serotonin from going back up. Because we want the serotonin to stay in this area because when it stays in the synapse, when it stays in here, we feel so much better. We're not depressed. So we want serotonin to stay in this area. We don't want it to go back up because if it goes back up, we're going to feel, we're going to have less serotonin. And when we have less serotonin, we're not going to feel good. So for depression, what we want is we want serotonin to stay in this area. We also like it when norepinephrine um, so norepinephrine is also another one that makes us feel good. So serotonin and norepinephrine. We want it to stay in this area. We don't want it to go back up um, and you know go away from our from us. We want it to stay in, in our in our body in our synapse so that we can feel better. So these are great drugs for antidepressants. And the Prozac is a good example of a serotonin of an SSRI serotonin or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. 
Another antidepressant is bupropion, and bupropion is a strong medication, also known as Welbutrin. But the only thing is that um, it and it's a dopamine related, so it, it tries to keep the dopamine in you, and dopamine makes you feel good. But it has seizures, so people who take this could also get seizures. So that's why it, the the side effect is pretty bad with this medication. So here's a question for you guys. The selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are used to treat which condition? Depression, major depression, migraine, headaches, seizures, or schizophrenia? Yeah, it is for depression. That's right. If you chose depression, if you chose A, you are correct. Because remember, serotonin makes you feel good. Um, and because it makes you feel good, it will get rid of the depression. Anti-anxiety. So what if you're really anxious? If you're anxious, then you can take a drug that's known as a benzodiazepine. And benzodiazepine, there are like many different drugs that you can take. And notice that they either end in Z-E, diazepam, so they end in Z-E-P-A-M, lorazepam, so they again end in Z-E-P-A-M, or alpazolam, which ends in Z-O-L-A-M. So Zepam or Zolam, which is like Xanax, this is Xanax. How can you remember this? Well, imagine, let's think about this, Z-E for zebra. Imagine a uh, zebra named Pam, and this zebra who is named Pam is very, very calm. Okay, so imagine a calm zebra named Pam. And so then you can remember anything that ends in Zepam, diazepam, is, makes you very calm. Um, Zolam, maybe think uh, what starts with Zero, I don't know, a, a zombie, a zombie named Lamb, maybe? So a zombie whose name is Lamb and he was very, very calm, right? So anything that keeps you really calm, reduces the anxiety, um, ends in Zepam and Zolam, or Zolam. Okay, anticonvulsant. So what if you're seizing like crazy and you need a drug? The drug that you might be prescribed is phenytoin. And phenytoin is um, a great drug because it helps stop seizures, but it also causes gingival enlargement. So we looked at, um, there are three drugs actually that cause gingival enlargement. There is, we looked at nifedipine. And nifedipine is, remember it ends in pine. So this is a calcium channel blocker. So calcium channel blocker, which is for the heart. It helps with the heart. Then we have zinipedipine. We also have another one, which I'll talk about later on. It's called cyclosporin. And cyclosporin is another drug that causes gingival enlargement. Remember the C and C, you can combine that to make it gingival enlargement. Or the trick is, if you think of the word cyclo, think of like a bicycle. I cannot draw, but think of a bicycle. And when you think of a bicycle, um, when you think of this, you can think of that, that it causes gingival enlargement. The other drug that actually, by the way, cyclosporin, this is a drug for um, when you have a transplant. So if you get like a kidney transplant or um, a lung transplant or whatever transplant, cyclosporin is given to you to allow you to accept that transplant. And then phenytoin is another drug. This is an anticonvulsant. This is for seizures. And the way to remember phenytoin that causes gingival enlargement, and again, this is from student RDH. All of these tricks are from student RDH. Is when you think of phen, you might want to think of like you know one of those. Um, I can't even draw, but one of those uh, fans that you might have in your room when it's really hot, and. Um, you know, it spins, and when you think of that fan, so it might sound like fan. So when you think of fan, you can imagine this, right, happening. And so when you think of that, it might automatically make you think, oh, this is also one of the drugs that cause gingival enlargement. So phenytoin, nifedipine, and cyclosporin. They cause gingival enlargement. And so because we're on the topic of seizures and people who have seizures, what do you do when people have seizures? Well, if you can, move the plan to the floor. Um, if you can, tilt the plan's head to one side. The reason why it says tilt the patient's head to one side is to prevent any aspiration. So, like, you don't want them to swallow any food or liquid or something that could enter their airway or lungs. So, um, and, and you don't want it to cause pneumonia too. So, um, that's why they're saying tilt the patient's head to one side. And then anything sharp that's around them, just remove them all because you don't want it to get injured. You don't want them to get injured. All right, let's look at asthma and COPD. So asthma is considered a reversible airway obstruction. So when you can't breathe, but because um, 
the reason why this happens is you have inflammation here. You have lots of increase in secretions in the lungs and the swelling in the bronchioles. And the reason why someone can get asthma is because, well, maybe they're allergic, maybe they're exercising, maybe they're under a lot of stress, um, maybe there's pollution, and that can also cause asthma. So when you have clients with asthma, just minimize their stress so that they don't get asthma. And remember that they should always bring their puffer in with them for the appointment. And so signs of asthma is like they could be like, you know, short, having shortness of breath, and they could be wheezing like crazy. So it is reversible. It's reversible because the bronchioles are still healthy because if you look at COPD which is not reversible, it's irreversible, they're already damaged, right? That They have been destroyed, the bronchioles have been destroyed, but in asthma they're still healthy. So that's why it's um, reversible in asthma because it's still healthy, it's irreversible here with COPD which is chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease because that's, if you look at the bronchioles, it's already damaged. Now, for to treat them, you could use a, an MDI, which is a meter dose inhaler. So you can use an inhaler, and um, you always want them to bring that with them in the uh, dental when you have, when you have uh, them with you for an appointment. Now, there are two drugs that we're going to focus on. So if someone has asthma, there's short-acting beta-2 agonist, and there is long-acting beta-2 agonist. So let's look at this first. Beta-2. Beta 2, we use, there's beta 1 and there's beta 2. Beta 1 is for the heart. And the way to remember this, there's one heart. So the 1 stands for, it's um, with the heart. It's a beta blocker for the heart. Beta 2, when you see the number 2, is referring to the lungs. And the lungs, you can remember this, the 2, because we have two lungs. We have one heart, so beta 1 for heart. Two lungs, so beta 2 for the lungs. Now, we have albuterol, and albuterol is a medication for asthma and COPD, and it is short-acting. What does short-acting mean? Short-acting means if you take albuterol, you will be, you will get over the asthma in a short period of time. You'll feel better in a short period of time. So albuterol is short-acting, so proventil or ventilin. Um, ones. And again, from student RDH, what they said was think of vent, because it has the word vent in there. Think of vent from the Starbucks venti, and you're chugging it down really, really fast. And you feel so much better as soon as you chug it down really, really fast. So in a short period of time, you feel so much better because you chugged it down really fast. Um, when you think of pro vent, uh, student RDH was saying, you know, you're um, pro venting, you're venting really, really um, you're a pro at venting. You're, you're venting really, really fast so that you feel better right away. So it's short acting, it's fast acting. It you, you feel better so much. You feel so much better right away. So albuterol. If you take this drug, if you take this inhaler, if you take this puffer, you will feel a lot better right away. It's actually the um, the first line of treatment for someone who has these um, the asthma attack. Long acting is um, salmeterol or cervet. And salmeterol, again, from student RDH, think of sal salmon diet. So people who are on the salmon Mediterranean diet, they live for a long period of time. So that's how you can remember it long acting because salmon diet means you live for a very long period of time. Um, and so when you think of long acting, what does that mean? Well, that means that it takes a long time for um, it to start working. It, the reason for that is because it gets absorbed very slowly once you administer it. And also another thing to note that is the, the good thing about this long acting beta 2 agonist is that um, they stay in your they stay in your body for a long period of time and they release really slowly as when they're inside your body. So it's long acting because it's, it takes a long time for it to kick in because it's slowly absorbed. But once it's in, <clears throat> you get like the, it releases its effects slowly over time. So the active ingredients are released slowly. You can also take corticosteroids for asthma. So for people who have asthma, they may be also be prescribed on corticosteroids for a long period of time. And corticosteroids don't necessarily help with the, um, if you have an asthma attack, it doesn't help with the attack, the asthma attack, but it helps you recover. So it's good for recovery and it decreases the chance of you dying. And so it's, still, um, it's used in conjunction with the long acting um, beta 2 agonist. So they take this and corticosteroids if they, you know, have asthma. 
and it's for people who have mild, moderate, or even severe asthma. Now, when you take this puffer with corticosteroids, like um, these corticosteroids that are lifted here, which are calzone, um, you can get thrush. So a good way to get rid of that is to encourage them as soon as they take this drug, make sure they rinse with water to avoid the candidiasis, to avoid the thrush. What is the first line of defense for an intermittent asthma attack? So someone has an asthma attack and they want to recover right away. What is the best thing you can give them? What's the first line of defense? What's the first thing you give them? Short acting. It's D, short acting, because you want them to um, recover right away. You want something that will quickly um, work. And so short acting means in a short period of time, they will recover. They will get better. Oral adverse effects of chronic use of inhaled corticosteroids include what? It includes candidiasis. Okay, so this can happen. So as we talked about, when someone is um, using corticosteroids a lot, they can get thrush, they can get candidiasis. And so it's really important that they rinse with water every time they inhale corticosteroids, every time they take that puffer, because it can prevent um, them from getting flush. After stomatitis, this is like canker sores, herpetic lesions, these are like cold sores, and xerostomia means dry mouth. Okay, local anesthesia. So when we're looking at local anesthesia, these, these are uh, drugs that help you numb your mouth or numb your teeth and gums. And so there are two types, there's esters and amines. And the biggest difference between the two is that esters have, actually, if you look at all of them, they all end in cane, right? Do you see that? They all end in cane. But when you look at amides, amides has an I in their, in their, in that word, right? Amide has an I, and so do all the um, amides listed below. They all have an I before the cane. Lidocaine has an I, right? Mepivacaine has an eye. All of them have an eye before the cane. But when you look at esters, I don't see any eyes before the cane. Right? Benzo, no eye. Uh, cocaine, no eye. Procaine, no eye. Tetracaine, no eye. So esters are, you know, have no eye and they're actually broken down in the blood. Whereas amides, they have an eye and they're broken down or metabolized in the liver. So let's look at this question. All of these local anesthetic agents are amides except for which one? Procaine. Procaine is an ester because there is no I before the cane. This one is, um, propivacaine is an amide because we see the I before the cane. Mepivacaine is an amide. Amide because we see an I before the cane. Lidocaine is an amide because we see an I before the cane. And phylocaine is an amide because we see the I before the cane. But procaine doesn't have an I, hence it's an ester. Okay, if you look here, an ester, procaine. So things to keep in mind is when we're looking at cardiac patients or people with heart issues, when we're giving them epinephrine, so sometimes with local anesthetic, we add epinephrine. Like we'll give lidocaine with epinephrine. And I'll tell you why in a bit. But if we have a cardiac patient, you do not want to give too much epinephrine. Just 0.04 is your, is your maximum, okay? No more than 0.04. Because for a healthy patient, we can give up to 0.2, people who don't have um, heart issues. So cardiac patients, 0.04. Other things to consider, epinephrine we don't give to people who have uncontrolled diabetes, they're not managing their diabetes, or if someone is on an antidepressant or a cyclic antidepressant. But the key thing to remember here is cardiac patients, 0.04 milligram is your max dose of epinephrine. So these are many different types of local anesthetic. Light, we're going to talk about the three main ones that I want you guys to know. Lidocaine is the one that is the safest, safe to use in pregnancy. And if most of the time when we give lidocaine, we might give them with epinephrine. Epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor. So if you look at this next slide, when you give a local anesthetic with epinephrine, what it does is it constricts your blood vessel. So the blood vessel gets smaller, right? 
from big, it gets small. And when that happens, that's good because epinephrine allows this vasoconstriction so that the local anesthetic won't get easily flushed up like you see here. When we have epinephrine, when it gets vasoconstricted, the local anesthetic will stay in that area for a longer period of time. So it will stay numb for a longer period of time. It won't get flushed up that fast. So when you have epinephrine, when you add epinephrine, you stay numb for longer. If you don't add epinephrine into the lidocaine, then we say it's lidocaine plain. Lidocaine plain means no epinephrine was added, no vasoconstriction was added. Mepivacaine can have a vasoconstrictor, but it's not epinephrine as you see. It has levonorgeferrin, and that's a vasoconstrictor that's used for mepivacaine. Um, if it doesn't have the vasoconstrictor, then we say mepivacaine plain. And it's used for short dental procedures, so it's not, you won't stay in one for a long period of time. For pipicane, however, um, it takes a long time for it to kick in, so it's a slow onset, but it can be used for long dental procedures. In fact, it can keep you numb for seven hours. If you needed to do a very long dental procedure, but pipicane would be your local anesthetic of choice because it can keep you numb for seven hours. Ideally, though, most people like to use lidocaine. Alright. Let's look at nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide is also known as laughing gas. Um, I know my kids get nitrous oxide when they have their uh, dental work done. The, just keep in mind that people who cannot get nitrous oxide or you know, breathe in that laughing gas are people who have respiratory issues. So people who have COPD, people who have stuffed nose, um, people who are pregnant, especially in the first trimester of pregnancy, and even people with bowel obstructions. Um, interesting to note is that if you're a dental professional who are working around nitrous oxide, there have been studies that show that you could even have miscarriages or get abortion, um, have spontaneous abortions or miscarriages, and you could, your child could even have genetic effects. So there's a way to monitor how much nitrous oxide you're around. Nitrous oxide is a strong anesthetic agent, true or false? The answer is false. It's not strong. It's weak. Um, if it was strong, it would put you to sleep. Nitrous oxide does not put you to sleep. Nitrous oxide just calms you down. It does not put you to sleep. In fact, um, the next question actually tells you what nitrous oxide does. So all of the following are characteristics of nit nitrous oxide except... Except this one. It does not slow down your heart rate. We don't like not monitoring your heart rate when we're doing nitrous oxide. But it is a weak anesthetic because it doesn't put you to sleep. It is a strong analgesic. It's a good pain um, management. It's a good you know, drug for pain management. It has strong amnesia. You actually do forget. There is a little loss of memory. So when kids take it, you know, a procedure could be half an hour long, but they might think it was just only two minutes long. So the, you know, the loss of memory part is, is uh, there with nitrous oxide. But it does not slow down your heart rate. Okay, so this is an exception. Okay, we're almost done. Three more slides and then uh, we're done with uh, pharmacology. So we were looking at the cyclosporine before and we said the cyclosporine causes gingival enlargement. And think of this as cyclo, cyclo for if you think of a bicycle, the cycle, you right? might, we might, we might be thinking of an O and when we think of an O, think of gingival enlargement. The reason why someone would take this drug is because if they get a transplant, if they get a transplant, um, they would need this drug to trick their body to accept that transplant. Otherwise, without this drug, the body will reject the transplant. So we need this type of drug, it's an immunosuppressant drug, so that you do not reject that organ that you just got transplanted in you. Biphosphonate drugs. So, um, there are cancer patients who um, may be in pain and they may be taking a biphosphonate drug. And this drug is, this is actually, let's re retract a little bit. This is a drug that is used um, to prevent the bone from getting weak. So it's used for osteoporosis and any other similar diseases. It's also, people who have cancer can also take this drug because it's shown to slow down the tumor development. The only downside is sometimes you can get osteonecrosis of the jaw. So sometimes um, after like you do a dental procedure, you might see that the jaw bone is starting to you know, deteriorate, starting to die. And that is a downside with biophosphonate drugs. So it does impact the bone. 
Lastly, we're going to look at diabetes. So we have two types of diabetes. Type 1 are people who um, cannot make any insulin. And insulin is really important because it, insulin is a hormone that regulates blood sugar. It basically is uh, keeps blood sugar levels within the desired range. And if you don't have insulin, if you can't make your body doesn't make insulin, then you're going to have to inject insulin so that you can control the sugar level in your body. So that's type 1 diabetes where you have to inject the insulin. Type 2 diabetes, it means that you have insulin, but the insulin um, is not working properly or your body cannot make enough insulin. So you need a little bit more insulin. So that you might need medication. So metformin or Fortimet is a great one for diabetes. It's a common one, commonly uh, used drug for diabetes. And if you look at metformin and Fortimet, they have the same letters kind of within each term. So that's how within each word. That's how you can remember they kind of go hand in hand. Fortimet is the trade name. Metformin, because it's lowercase, is the generic name. So here's a question. Which of the following diagnostic tests measure glycemic control over time? So measure glycemic is like when I think of glycemic, I think of glucose. It's the HbA1c. So HbA1c is um, a test that the individuals with diabetes go for every two to six months. They have to go for blood work and they measure, they measure the HbA1c level. And if it is 7% or lower, we, um, that's good. Okay, that means it's good. We're happy. But if it's higher than 7%, then that is not stable. It is not good. So anytime you're doing debridement with someone who has diabetes, ask them for the HbA1c level. Because if it is less than 7%, that's good. But if it is higher than 7%, um, then we may not want to see them because they are, it's uncontrolled. And we only want to see um, individuals that are controlled so they don't have a medical emergency. What they do over here with the HbA1c test is they come up with an average number of what the blood glucose um, actually the test measures the percentage of hemoglobin in the red blood cell that is stuck onto glucose and it kind of it's to make it very simply what it does is it measures your recent average blood sh um, sugar or glucose level and because it's an average measurement you don't really need to fast on that day so if you're diabetic you don't really fast when you go for that blood work but it just kind of measures the average um, glucose or HbA1c level so 7% or lower is great all right that's all um, again I have many many videos on pharmacology found in my playlist so if you find that there are some sections here that didn't stick feel free to refer to my other videos thank you guys